So thank you all again for joining our session on mobilizing the community to address COVID-19. I'm really excited to get started. Um, the presenters today are myself. My name is Priscilla Bolander and I'm a program manager on the Community Health Innovation Strategy here at Sinai Urban Health Institute. And I'll be joined by my colleague, I'm Kim Jay. I'm the senior CHW consultant and trainer with Sinai Urban Health Institute and one of the lead trainers under our training arm crowd. Thanks, Kim. So on the agenda for today, we're going to be looking at the background and the rationale for the Contact Tracing Corp project before diving into what it actually took to create this massive public health workforce. Um, we're going to end today's session looking at what's being done to prepare contact tracers for future employment opportunities, whether that be in public health or um, in other occupational areas. So COVID-19 has been felt um, all over the world. Heartbreak um, has been felt all over the world, but I think in Chicago in particular, that effect of COVID-19 has been strikingly uneven. This data is from the Chicago Department of Public Health, and it was taken only four months after the pandemic caused the entire city to shut down. You can see that the rate of infection for communities of color compared to white populations, um, it's just extremely disproportional. And so we, we know that black and brown communities have felt COVID-19 the, the strongest. Um, and while this might not necessarily come as a surprise, I know I was not surprised by, by this data, I think it just sheds a, a, shines a light on the longstanding racial inequities in health and economic outcomes that we see over and over again, particularly in Chicago. Um, these longstanding inequities are really the origin and the foundation for Sinai Urban Health Institute's work. It's, it's what fuels us to strive towards our vision for all communities to, to thrive in health. So over the past 20 years, and I think Helen mentioned it's actually been 21 years, we've developed a unique expertise in working alongside community members to find solutions uh, to overcome barriers to addressing their health needs. We, we really uh, value the, the power of community health workers and we know that community health workers, since they're from the community, we pull them from the community and they serve the community directly. And that grassroots approach is really, really necessary to actually create connection with community members and to build trust, to earn respect, um, and to communicate effectively for, for healthy behavior change. From this, Sinai Urban Health Institute has taken all of this wealth of information and we've established our Center for CHW Research, Outcome, and Workforce Development known as CROWD. And at CROWD, this is a beautiful picture of Fatima, one of our training managers, um, doing one of the trainings that we offer at CROWD. And so CROWD really offers a lot of support on hiring and training um, and supervising community health workers. We also give input on how to integrate community health workers into health systems, as well as how to evaluate a, a community health worker program. So because of our long standing history in community health training and community health work, Sinai Urban Health Institute was selected as one of the partner organizations to contribute to the Chicago COVID-19 Contact Tracing Corps. And in July, the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, you can see the small logo on the bottom left of the screen, they received a grant from the Chicago Department of Public Health to Lead in or to lead an effort um, on preventing and mitigating the spread of COVID-19. And I think this project is extremely unique in that it takes on a community-based approach. They are pulling members from the community to serve the community, which is a reoccurring theme in our work at SUHI. And so the project is also unique in that it targets communities that have experienced multiple levels of disparities, um, including economic, hardship um, and lack of economic opportunity. So the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership subcontracted with four organizations um, all along the bottom of the screen, Malcolm X College, NORC at the University of Chicago, Sinai Urban Health Institute, which that's our old logo, but Sinai Urban Health Institute, and the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health. It's been so rewarding personally to work with amazing partners on this initiative especially given how fast and rapidly evolving it was. 
Um, we were all tasked with, pro with providing support for onboarding, for hiring, um, hiring support, training, professional development opportunities, technical assistance, uh, evaluation support. So it, it's been a, a big team effort for this project. So before I go into the approach of the project, I just wanted to put this map on the screen. Um, it shows you by zip code, the COVID-19 percent positivity. So take a look at this map and look at this next map and see how it really overlaps. The purple map is showing economic hardship, the communities uh, with, this, with strong economic hardship and the project is really investing in these dark purple uh, communities. They're investing in these dark purple communities through contact tracing employment opportunities. And those employment opportunities are housed within 31 community-based organizations. So these 31 community-based organizations were selected through a, a competitive grant application process. And what's very interesting is that a lot of them, the majority I would say of these community-based organizations do not have a health-driven mission. Um, what they do have, sorry, is familiarity with the community. They have trust. Um, they have a positive reputation for providing resources for that community, for those communities. And so I think they, they were pivotal um, for the success of this project. Okay, so before going into the timeline, again, I want to stress how um, Remarkable the experience has been in just seeing how it has evolved so rapidly. We're trying to create this program with the added pressure of responding to an emergency um, in live time. So in July, as I mentioned, the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership is chosen to lead the project. By August, these community-based organizations have undergone the application process and the 31 CBOs are selected. September comes one month later and we're already um, selecting people from the community who have historically encountered barriers to employment and we're hiring them as contact tracers, contact tracing supervisors, and so they're working in capacities that they've never worked in before. By October, the intensive training is taking off. Contact tracers and contact tracing supervisors have to do a 12-hour online training offered by Malcolm X College. Once they've completed that training, they're able to take our SUHI booster sessions, um, which Kim will go into a little bit later. The booster session training, they also had training on Salesforce, which is the platform that the contact tracers use to actually record and make outbound calls um, to communities all over the city. We also had a lot of role play support from the Chicago Department of Public Health. And so it was an intense moment for our training team to be, uh, training 600 contact tracers. So I think in, in October, this is also where we start seeing some implementation challenges. Um, as expected, the project, you know, it really caused us to have to pivot constantly as, as the needs are demanding it from us. And so we saw some implementation challenges. And for, as an example, I can say, um, digital literacy for a lot of contact tracers wasn't at the level that it needed to be. A lot of supervisors who were hired didn't feel confident in supervising contact tracers, especially in this virtual environment. And so the partners worked collectively to address the needs as they came. Um, for example, at Malcolm X College provided uh, kind, kind of a last minute, not last minute, but I don't think it was planned for um, initially, training for supervisors to be able to assess their contact tracers and provide support. So by December, I think the contact tracing core, we really found our groove. We found a nice rhythm. People were feeling confident. They were using the Salesforce platform. Our training team at SUHI initiated our communities of practice, which are um, monthly skills building workshops. We also initiated our office hours, which were weekly um, problem solving support sessions. And Kim will go into that a little bit later as well. But one thing, two things that we actually didn't anticipate uh, that posed a challenge and also caused partners to have to pivot our efforts yet once again, is that the call volume for the contact tracers was much lower than anticipated, especially for a workforce this size. 
Um, so call volume was lower than expected. Another thing is that around December, you guys probably remember, the media is starting to flood news with information on vaccines. And with real news comes fake news. And so we start recognizing um, all the myths. I'm going to become sterile. You're going to inject a microchip. And so the myths were kind of entertaining from a public health standpoint, but they were uh, just all over the place. And so our amazing partners at UIC decided to do a survey amongst contact tracers, given that they are representative of their community, to see how uh, much vaccine hesitancy there was within our core. This is an example of one of those questions. Um, how likely are you to receive the COVID-19 vaccine when it is made available to you? Now, if you can, if you can see, even through all of this training um, that the contact tracers have undergone, still about one third of the contact tracers are either neutral, shown in gray, or unlikely yellow and dark blue, um, to receive the vaccine. And so another question, what would convince people in your neighborhood to get vaccinated? We see that primarily safety communication um, through trusted messengers is what's really needed to, to address um, vaccine hesitancy in our communities. So I'm going to return to my timeline and I'm going to tell you how we address this hesitancy. But first, I kind of want to back up a little bit and give an opportunity for my colleague, Kim, to, get to, to give some more detail on the training that was involved for the right. Contact Tracing Corps. Thank you so much, Priscilla, for giving this background. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about how, uh, as a facilitator, a part of our team, we were able to address uh, getting our contact tracers acclimated to their roles. Now, uh, Priscilla had already said that in December, we sort of got our groove. People sort of knew what they were doing, but um, things changed. It was a continuous moving target. So we had to make sure that the contact tracers that were hired with the minimal background of public health or how to address these health concerns had the surround support they needed to do the job at hand. These community members were commissioned to do a job that they had very little knowledge about, but we wanted to give them again, the support that they needed to operate in this role effectively. So uh, as we onboarded them, we noticed that uh, most of the hires that uh, were employed through the contact tracing effort were from the black and brown communities, African-American and Hispanic communities. Uh, we saw that over two thirds of those hires were made up uh, of those contact tracers. And some of the backgrounds of the people that were hired were extremely diverse. Um, some of these were uh, veterans, some had been previously incarcerated, some had absolutely uh, no experience at all, and some had, you know, as much as a high school uh, diploma. But that wasn't the deciding factor about that the determining who could do it and who could not do it because the people that had already expe expressed a passion. They had already expressed a desire to make some changes in their community. So we were charged with getting them ready sort of to dispel their own myths, to address their concerns so that then in turn, they could take the truth message of what was happening in the medical community to the community members in a way that they could understand, that they can relate to, and that uh, they will be willing to uh, at least pose a conversation so they can make some clear choices. What this uh, initiative was really designed to do was intentional. It was to address the economic uh, um, lack in these communities, as well as provide a pathway to future work uh, in the public health arena. So what we knew we had to do was to expand the knowledge. So we wanted to introduce the contact traces to the world of community health, which is really an umbrella term, but the characteristics or the qualifications that make a person a community health worker were already outlined. They have to come from the, the communities that they serve. They provide relatable health information in a manner that community members could understand. They were trusted members of the community and they could identify 
identify some of the challenges and sort of bridge those gaps in a way that community members could believe in and could uh, rely on. Now, um, again, we had to address those concerns of our contact tracers before we can even empower them to connect with those um, patients and clients that they were calling, that they were reaching out to, because we uh, advise our contact tracers that really you have to be truthful, you have to be honest. And if they didn't believe in the process, how indeed could they relay the message to those that they were trying to help? So having those community members uh, come in with the initial qualifications, we were able to layer on the support that they needed. And we did that in a few ways. We uh, knew that once they came from their Malcolm X training that there could be some loopholes or some gaps missing in uh, the, the work that they were doing. So the booster sessions were designed to fill those gaps, also to provide role plays and a deeper understanding of practical knowledge of what their role would entail. Additionally, we had our communities of practice. Communities of practice were a monthly held training session that uh, provided those skill-based trainings that include social support, um, different areas of our core skills that we felt were necessary in order for our contact tracers to do their role well. And because the demand was there, the, the uh, the ask was always shifting. So it never really settled to just one way of doing the role or one way of doing work. There were always things coming in. So we had to be adjustable and pliable to be able to match what was asked of them in an effort of training and giving them that support. So we added in the office hours. And when it, within the office hours, it was an opportunity and a time for those contact tracers to get a deeper dive into what was happening and also to create some relationships that will help them facilitate a better working knowledge of the tasks that were ahead of them. So when we talk about the communities of practice, you see these um, highlighted training modules that we offered, stress management, motivational interviewing, introduction to community health and culture humility. We felt these were necessary in the beginning because the role was so demanding. And for somebody who had never done this work before, they needed the framework, they needed the outline. So, so uh, providing that social support, that work-life balance, uh, addressing readiness for change, things of that nature uh, were pivotal in getting them acclimated. And one of the things we wanted to make them aware of was even how to be culturally competent within your approach. Although the initial idea was that, you know, coming from the community, you will work directly with the community that you came from, that had to change. However, the qualities that they had to connect because they understood the challenges overall made them a great fit. So we wanted to fine tune their approach so they can do well in their roles. And you know, you're always checking into your contact tracers to making, making sure they're okay. And some of the feedback we got from these different training opportunities was that it was a great opportunity for personal growth. Uh, the facilitators were excellent and that uh, the training was exciting, it was never boring. And that was key to us because if you're not able to receive the information in a way that you could really uh, digest, it was really not even worth being together. And these training sessions contain over 200 people at a time. So we had to make sure we made it impactful and we made it uh, specific to the needs that they were experiencing what they were going through. So uh, as we said earlier, that the needs were ever changing and ever moving. And we knew we needed to be able to be a support system, a wraparound support system for the contact tracers. So the office hours were, were born. And in this area, it was a safe space for the contact tracers to come to. And they could talk about whatever they wanted to do that was facing them in their role. If it was personal or if it was professional, it was a, also a time for people to build um, those social networks that was kind of difficult in this virtual arena. I mean, how do you really embrace and show somebody you care in this virtual uh, a time that we're living in? But we were able to do that by having this space available every week and allowing the contracts, 
contact traces to come with their uh, challenges, work through them together, and also provide that personal support. And it, we found it to be very powerful and really the place where most of them gained the most support uh, uh, for the work that they were doing in contact tracing itself. So uh, we talked about the skill sets that we layered on within those communities of practice. And we were able to see that in real time through uh, actions that happened whilst the contact tracers were employed. One of the managers lifted up in one of our um, office hours that they experienced a death on their team. But they knew from some of the trainings that they had received that they had to approach one of their colleagues a different way with this information. Uh, they knew that um, if they had received this information in a way that was not strategic or deliberate, what they received regarding that death would have been devastating. And if you can see and read this comment, it is confirmation that having um, the framework of how to approach difficult conversations and difficult situations is important and it happens in real life and they experienced it while doing the work. And uh, we found that what we were able to add was very helpful for them. And now back to our timeline. Thanks, Kim. I don't know. Can you guys see me? Yes, we can. Okay. Because <laughs> I see you, Kim. Um, thank you. So yes, we're coming back to our timeline. And let me just remind you, we left off in December when we had a group going. Um, low call volume was an issue for the contact tracing core, as well as the media flooding, um, just flooding our, our interwebs with false information around vaccine. So in January, alongside our partners at UIC, the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health, we designed or we, we uh, planned for a vaccine education week. And in this vaccine education week, we invited doctors from UIC and doctors from the Chicago Department of Public Health to participate on a panel. Um, and during this panel, they were basically debunking common misconceptions around the vaccine uh, and they also provided contact tracers with the space to ask live questions. And so that really kicked off um, our partners providing multiple uh, webinars and information sessions around vaccine. So one thing that we have not mentioned yet is that at the start of this project, something that's also very unique to this project, contact tracers and contact tracing supervisors were allotted seven hours a week if they were full-time to use um, work time to, uh, to do trainings and, and um, build some professional skills that they could use in the future. So it could be related to contact tracing and public health, or it could be related to uh, whatever they were considering for the future, whatever they are considering for the future. Since call volume was low and, you know, we're providing them with all these learning opportunities around vaccine, a lot of contact tracers took full advantage of those seven hours and joined multiple discussions and by February, they, they really were our trusted messengers. Um, in February, the Chicago Department of Public Health starts their vaccination pods. And this is their attempt to just begin vaccine rollout. And the contact tracers were called upon to help staff these vaccination pods. And so it's the first time that we're seeing how agile the workforce has become. We're seeing uh, that their skills and their experience is directly transferable to other types of community health work. So it's really exciting. And in March, the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership decides to restructure the contact tracing core. And so, um, and so it's now referred to, currently we're referring to this as the Chicago COVID-19 Community Response Corps. And again, we're pivoting, we're shifting, we're constantly evolving, and it's because the needs are changing. Call volume for contact tracing was low, but it's still needed. So number one, we still have contact tracers designated for contact tracing. Uh, where the greatest need is, is actually in assisting with scheduling people for their vaccines and answering questions around the vaccines. So the largest uh, group of core members actually falls in number three to answer, the, to answer those phones and to, to schedule people. 
The second component of this new restructuring is promotores or community health workers. And these are roughly 150, 160 contact tracers who are going to be doing boots on the ground outreach in the communities targeting the Latinx and the African-American communities. And they're gonna be focusing on vaccine hesitancy and also trying to get people to schedule their vaccines or at least assisting with vaccine uh, registration. Um, I think this workforce, you know, it, it's proven that it's capable of, of shifting, it's capable of rising to the occasion. I think it's proven to be an effective investment in public health workforce initiatives. Um, and so we're finally reaching a, our new rhythm. I think we got things under control and it's feeling pretty good. So a lot of our partners are now focusing their efforts on providing contact tracers or core members more generally with different opportunities to utilize those seven hours because remember they still can can get access to training paid training um, so those are known as earn and learn hours the goal of earn and learn is for core members to develop marketable skills and meaningful work experience while increasing awareness of careers that exist and making decisions about career trajectory um, the, the core members, I keep referring to them as contact users, the core members uh, have access to this big calendar where they can see all the different learning opportunities that are available to them and they can register and participate in whatever is interesting for them. So for example, career guidance and exploration, this first point, we organized with, along with UIC, a CHW, a community health worker career panel. So in this career panel, we invited community health workers who have experience in different realms of community health work. So one of our community health workers was heavily involved in research. One was heavily involved in advocacy, disease prevention and management and violence prevention. And so we had this panel just to kind of open contact tracers or core members eyes at the different areas within public health. You know, it is this massive umbrella but it's very important work and they're already doing it. I personally feel that contact tracer and community health worker is one and the same. Um, other types of earn and learn opportunities are for example, interviewing skills, resume writing, um, WIOA 101, which is funding, federal funding opportunities for certificates in various programs, whether that's in public health or in, in other occupational areas. I didn't know what I was doing could open doors for me in community health work. Thank you for opening my eyes. So for many of the core members, this was a job. It was a job, you know, in a pandemic at a time when a lot of people are struggling. And so I think it's just been personally very rewarding to see people take this role, take contact tracing and they own it. And they're going, they're going with it. They're taking advantage of all the opportunities. And you can see the wheel spinning as they start to assess you know, what their professional career might look like in the future. So I'll hand it over to Kim. Yeah, but before I get into this testimonial, I just wanna just um, uh, digress to say that some of the most powerful experiences was uh, in this process was seeing the evolution of the contact tracers uh, along this very, very fast moving train. We refer to it very often as building the bike while we were riding it. And, uh, but the tenacity that was exhibited uh, was amazing. And then to have the support, the wraparound support uh, that we, uh, provided for them was so powerful in keeping them motivated and even ex exposing them to the world of public health. Many of them did not realize that this was an opportunity that they could dive into right where they were. Uh, in an earlier session, there was talk about what what do I need to do in order to be a, a community health worker? Do I have to have a degree? Do I have to have all these different letters behind my name? And being able to express to them that that was a no, that if you had that, that was fine, that was an added benefit. But if you didn't, there are some innate qualities that you already possess that we can help refine to make you ready to do the role that is involved in public health. Um, the to see the faces every week and to speak with them and even to see the challenges that they were going through um, caused us to always be um, ready to edit 
our program to give them the support that they needed to do this work. Because again, if you've never done it before, if you've never been exposed to it, you need somebody to help walk you through it. And not only did it enhance them, but it empowered them to be self-sufficient in their own communities, have a pathway after this whole role is over and be able to be um, proud about the work that they were doing because they were indeed changing lives. They were indeed changing perspectives. And again, addressing their concerns first made them our trusted messengers. We did not try to give them information to make them, um, to convince anybody one way or the other. We, put, we wanted true knowledge and information being provided to allow people to make choices. Because again, we were up against some historical situations that caused doubt and even some situational things that caused people to, to feel uh, disconnected or disenchanted. Uh, so we had to address all those things. Um, and within these uh, opportunities of um, education, of social support, they built a community. Uh, even in this virtual divide, they were able to connect with one another and reach out and be able to build relationships that sometimes only happen when you're in person. But to do this in these unprecedented times was really remarkable. remarkable. And I refer to them always as pioneers um, in doing this work in this air in this uh, method. Um, and one of the testimonials that we uh, received was. Um, we asked the question, actually, there was a question asked about this whole interaction. And it was, um, how did this change your mind about public health and what it has it done with to your family? And the testimony was that, it, you know, it's changed my mind knowing that there is a career that I can uh, be helpful in and enjoy um, and um, love helping people in a way, in any way possible, and I did not know a health promoter, what a health promoter was until now. I feel great and empowered to do good and make a difference with one individual at a time. So to me, that was really a powerful statement to be able to introduce community members to a world they thought was not available to them and empower them with knowledge and professional development to uh, better prepare them and then continual support to help grow them was powerful. And the picture that you see is from our first inaugural class, a promotoras uh, that just completed on yesterday, who will be doing some boots on the ground work in their communities, helping, connecting, and even uh, sharing knowledge on a larger scale. So um, again, as a member of this amazing process, it's been really um, awesome to see the growth and uh, the change and the contact traces that we were uh, very graciously allowed to train and um, motivate. So in summary, we know that the COVID response, you know, it just took a unique approach. We had to deal with two things, you know, getting a, a workforce developed and a pandemic, but um, the community members were utilized to employ this initiative, and that was really powerful, and I give kudos to all those who were a part of that. Um, there were multiple streams of training, and the, the support was just amazing because we made it wrap around so that any areas that they felt they needed additional uh, help in, we had it ready for them, um, and the contact traces, again, were empowered. Um, they felt capable to do the work and they felt equipped. And also um, it's just really amazing. It was really, I'm sorry for that, really amazing for just to see their evolution and their progress along the way. And now we know for sure that they uh, feel like there is room for them in the world of public health. If they decide to go under the medical umbrella or just in advocacy or in another realm, they do know that these now are opportunities they can take part in. So uh, thank you for listening to us this afternoon. And right now we do have time um, to open up for questions from the room. Great, thank you, Kim and Priscilla. What a wonderful presentation. Um, I guess we have a first question here. So please, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. 
um, and we could ask our wonderful presenters. Um, but our first question is, what has been the most rewarding part of this program so far? Um, and what has been the most challenging aspect? Okay, now I can unmute. I know, I was like, unmute, unmute. Um, Kim, you want to say the most rewarding and I can, well, so personally, the most rewarding thing for me has been um, very recently, actually, we did a qualitative assessment in our office hours. And like I mentioned before, the office hours started in December and they've been weekly. We've been, you know, our training team has had contact with the contact tracers weekly up until the beginning of this month. And so this qualitative assessment was to just get some of their reactions on how they felt over the whole process. Um, and one of the questions I think we asked is if they felt the office hours were necessary. And so I was just <laughs> floored with the emotional responses that we received. And I didn't realize how important the office hours were to the team. Um, because like starting a new job in a virtual environment, it, it is difficult. And so our team has done an incredible job with creating a sense of community. Um, they love, you know, they love Kim. Uh, so it's, it's just really rewarding. I think some of the challenges that we faced were just like I mentioned before, the, the constant pivots and, and changes. And when you're dealing with a group this size, it's, it's a lot of emails, it's a lot of reiterating the processes and the protocols, and you have to do this before you can do that. And so that, you know, it was a little bit exhausting in the beginning, um, and especially with all the different changes. But like I said, we finally, we got a rhythm and we're, we're doing well. <laughs> And I would say for me, the most re rewarding part of it was to introduce so many um, community members to the world of public health and to sort of impart some of the passion I felt about doing community health work with them and share it with them and to see how they were able to thrive in some really trying uh, moments, you know, dealing with COVID was not easy for any of us, you know, and then trying to tell somebody over the phone, you know, I'm sorry to let you know, but you've been exposed. It was um, a, a mountain we had to, you know, get over. And we did that with the support and with the, uh, the, the office hours and with the communities of practice and to see them thrive in those kind of just rough environments was really, really, really rewarding for me because many of them could have just walked away, um, but they didn't, they stayed the course. And as Priscilla already alluded to, some of the challenges were just a constant pivot, but but again, to champion that, the agility of the team uh, to, to just move at moment's notice to accommodate those needs was amazing. So it was a little bit give and take. Um, and I guess when you take the good with the bad, you come out with a, with a, with a great end result. And I think that's what we were left with. Fantastic, thank you, um, Kim and Priscilla. And I, I think the comments just says how great of a work you both have been doing. A um, lot of praise in the comments, which I think is very well deserved. Um, but what's not there are more questions. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please put them in the chat. I know we have a bit more time until our closing session. Um, perfect, thank you. Can you just, Kim and Priscilla, can you describe Suhi's training model and methods? I'm gonna leave this one up to Kim, but I also want to encourage uh, Fatima Padron or Chandria or May to jump in uh, if they, they like. We have a meeting. So, so what I wanted to do was really yeah. acknowledge the team as a whole, because it was not just Priscilla and I, this was a huge endeavor. And as um, uh, that are on the call right now, Fatima, who is, you know, the Interventures Manager, she's absolutely amazing, who even during her own uh, challenges has been able to be a champion with rolling out the information and setting things up, Chandria. Uh, Awesome, May, Jeanette, they were constant and these were not easy sessions. We had to do a lot of work. And when we talk about the model, um, uh, the, the training model is really uh, based on uh, the core skills 
or C3 requirements or recommendations, which are some foundational skills that CHWs need to be effective in their role. And when it comes down to the CHW model for SUKI, um, I'll just give you my experience. I think to me, having more personal story gives people a better insight on even what even happens in the process of the community health work or journey. When I began my uh, career in community health work, I had no idea uh, what it was, how it was implemented, if I even qualified, because it was on a medical realm. And I just did not have any clue about what that was. And when I came into the job to interview for and I heard all the things that were required of me, I was like, uh -uh, I don't want to do this. Let me just tank this interview. So I told them one day I'm going to be famous and I'm not going to come in and work one day. And uh, they went out, they deliberated, they came back and they go, we want to offer you this job. And I'm like, are you serious? Ugh. So I said, well, <clears throat> I guess I'm supposed to do this work. So uh, I got hired, I got trained, I went through the processes of going through my evaluations and my and my um, shadowing to get acclimated. And when I got hired, I got hired in a pinch. My supervisor at the time was uh, Jessica Ramsey, and she was actually doing my role until they hired me. So I got introduced to the clientele from her. And when I went into the home, I was like, whoa, uh, this is a lot to take in. And at that moment in my head, I had decided that, you know what, this is not something that I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the office. I'm going to resign because this is, I think I'm in a way over my head. But when I got into the office, I got a conversation from one of my colleagues and she told me what I saw was the reason why I was needed. And it, re it readjusted my focus. So when it comes down, um, uh, it gave me a different passion about making connections and imparting information to those that I served and not in a way that I seemed like the authority. I was one of them. I just had a little more information to help them uh, manage their uh, health better and their life better. And the biggest thing we had to tackle was not just the illness, but also the social determinants that came along with them, which took some skill sets uh, being introduced to me so that I can do that in a way that um, will be helpful and impactful. Um, uh, working in this capacity, I would have never done. But when I had to reinvent my focus of employment, I said that I would not take a job that I did not totally enjoy. I would just make a living some, doing something else. But as you can see, nine years later, I'm still here, uh, still working and still believing in the mission of community health, being from the community, understanding the community's challenges and being able to, to relate to them in a way that would uh, give them health. And that's mind, body and spirit, not just one route. I know I probably didn't answer that whole question, but um, you got what you got. <laughs> No, Kim, that was perfect. Thank you for that personal story, right? I think when we think about community health workers, think about the personal stories, the passion, as you mentioned, right? The leadership, the leaders of the community to guide them to better health. That's such an integral part of that story. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so our next question, how do you see the program functioning in the future? Mm, that, that, that question is kind of tricky because I feel that um, if anything, if we've learned anything about this project, it's been that it can start as one thing and completely change and end as, as something totally different. So, you know, I think the project will evolve as the needs change and as the needs are, are asking, are demanding us to change. Um, I, I don't, I really can't anticipate it's my first pandemic. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if Kim, you have any ideas? When I think about what could possibly be, because right now everything is a possibility, because we never thought we would be able to do something to this capacity, 600 people onboarded in a time that we were getting adjusted to being remote everything. But what I see with the, with the community members being 
educated and trained and these doors being open that if it's not even something that officially starts for them um, is like a, a carved out role, they can take the skill sets that they have right now and be an advocate in, in their communities, in their churches, in their organizations that they work for. They can, they can just I mean, they can do what whatever they, uh, their desires are when it comes to community connections. So uh, also with the um, earn and learn opportunities that are still there, they can even go to school and not worry about how they're going to pay for that. That can be, and then find a path that is great for them. But I think that um, I see them carrying the message of public health in a way that community members all across the state of Illinois and even further will uh, understand uh, where they sit in this whole scenario and how their independent self-efficacy can help move the needle for decreasing uh, inequities in communities that uh, we live in, we serve in, and that we champion for. I, I also think that um, I feel that you know, the partners that are working on this project, UIC, Malcolm X College, um, NORC at the University of Chicago, and the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, right now we are really ramping up these earn and learn opportunities. So that's going to be the immediate, um, the immediate future uh, of the core. It, we're providing just lots of different education and training opportunities. Um, I also think that across the nation, there's this big push and and in Illinois specifically, there's a big push for community health workers. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of opportunities, I think, for contact tracers to transition into those roles, even though, as I mentioned before, contact tracers are community health workers. So they're already in those roles. Um, yeah. Yeah, and those qualifications qualify them. <laughs> Those, those, those characteristics rather qualify them uh, to be under that um, umbrella term. And with the, the they, they alluded to it earlier about the bill, which I'm not gonna go into detail right now, but the bill that talks about uh, community health work and the, the importance of having those. Now we have a, a small little army that can go out and, and tout the name of community health work so that more and more people are aware of that role. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is gonna be more about ev evaluating the interaction between community health workers and patients and providers. So the question is, does SUHI use an evaluation for patients or providers to complete once they've had a CHW connection? So within the interventions that I've been a part of at SUHI, they've been mostly asthma, some diabetes. There are um, evaluation, not evaluation, but data collection processes that we go through. And we collect this data at every interaction with the, with the patient so we can measure where they were when we met them and then where they ended up when we completed with them. All that, evalu all that data that's been collected then comes back in-house to our own evaluators for them to disseminate, look at the information, and then determine if what we did was effective, if we need to uh, edit it, or if it, or, or even what the outcome of from what we implemented, and you saw that in the circle that was presented earlier, uh, and then give that information back to the community. So uh, to answer that, yes, we do do that. We are able to see um, if what we have offered was uh, valid. And what I do love about Suhi's approach to evaluation is that we don't just go off of what we feel the community wants. We always get the input from the community first before we do it, uh, implement any intervention. And then once we implement the intervention, we, with the data collection that's collected, we bring it back. We add, we, we then determine was it, was it the right thing to do? Was it appropriate? And then once we found out those findings, we give it back to the, the community members. So they, they'll understand too and know, because like, um, like our late Steve Whitman always said, you know, data is no good if we can't translate it into services or to um, a community level so people can understand what it's all about. Because um, a lot of what we got as pushback from uh, communities of color is that it was always a take, but nothing else given back. And I think we, um, we have a different approach with how we do that. Great, thank you, Kim. And I think you bring up two very important parts of Suhi's model, right? Is we're always finding ways to 
better our programs? How, how, what can we do better to serve the communities that we serve, right? And I think the other part is giving back. Um, I think it's important to disseminate what we find back to the communities that we're trying to help, right? Because we're in this together. All right, um, so our next question is, what specifically will I believe Suhi do moving forward with training starting next week? What is expected of the community-based organizations and their team of CHWs? I have a feeling this is referring to the promotoras training. Um, so so sign our, our training team at here at Suhi just finished completing a two week long, pretty intensive training for the promotoras and community health worker um, restructure that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And basically this, they were given our CHW core skills module. That's normally a full-time 40 hour um, session given in one week if it's live and this was given virtually. So it was broken up into two weeks. Um, and so this is to provide the promotoras and the community health workers just with those essential skills that they need to do that boots on the ground work What's unique about this is we are just giving them the skills. Each community-based organization that is starting the Promotora Initiative, they have their own work plan. So they have all designed how they will do this outreach, how they will do the boots on the ground work. And so, so the Promotoras have to apply the skills that they've used in, in very different ways. And um, I've seen the work plans, but each CBO will be different. That was probably a promo that I asked me. I know you guys can't see my video. This is Fatima. I was introduced as part of the training team earlier. Um, but I just wanted to add in that what Priscilla just stated speaks to um, something we've heard over and over again today um, as a part of this conference in that at SUHI, we really like to um, make sure that each community is getting what it needs based on the specific needs of those communities. So each CBO knows what their community and their constituents need from them. And that's part of why each CBO kind of gets to decide what the promotores that um, are housed at their, or their organization are gonna work on and what their specific plan is and what their specific strategy is because it's tailored to exactly what that community needs. Great, thank you Priscilla and Fatima um, for that amazing answer. So I do not see any more questions in the chat box. So please feel free to continue asking questions will be around, I believe for the next five minutes. Um, but other than that, um, please stick around at 2.10. We will have our closing statement with a panel of stakeholders. Um, and that will be happening at 2.10. Um, otherwise, actually we have another question. How long is the grant for the CHWs? 10 months? So this was a, I think it was a two-year grant um, with one, one, one year for sure. And then they have not officially announced the ex an extension to, for a second year. But I think everybody's been hinting that, you know, it's likely to be extended. We haven't had any formal communication, but I don't want to give, I don't want to say anything that's going to get me in trouble starting today. So this is probably from the beginning of the grant. Yeah. And I know there are some people on the call who wanna know these details. And unfortunately that is not within our wheelhouse to share or even know for certain. So um, when it comes down to you know, the logistics of uh, the granting process and uh, how long that's gonna be, uh, that's a question we have to lift up to uh, the partnerships or to the CBOs that you are attached to. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Julie asked me to share this slide just because the next session that starts at 2.10 will be in the same exact room. So if you're here already, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, is there a need for, to, for bilingual CHWs? 
Absolutely. 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 Um, we talked to somebody asked earlier about, you know, is there, do you see it being demand for community health workers, especially in our current uh, climate? And I, and I say yes to that. I say bilingual CHWs uh, are definitely needed because again, when we're connecting with community, we want to make sure we're giving people information and support in uh, the languages that they would need it to be. And, um, and we want people to feel comfortable because with, again, with the definition, what a community health worker is, is somebody who comes from the community who looks like them, who speaks like them, understands the challenges. So being bilingual would be a plus for those communities that would need that additional support in making those connections to other social services. So long story short, yes, there is a need for bilingual CHWs and CHWs in general. I want to add a follow-up to, to that question, just because there may be a lot of residents, stakeholders in audience today, if someone wants to be to become a CHW, how what is the process to becoming a CHW? Well, that that avenue is kind of uh, is diverse. Uh, some people can uh, well, one route is definitely through training and our uh, two of our city colleges um, do offer a CHW program that they can take training and become get a certificate and uh, be a CHW uh, by name. Uh, so he definitely has a program under crowd that uh, has specific offerings. They can come take our 40 hour curriculum or multi hour curriculum and be certified um, in the community health work arena, but it does not certify them statewide because we have not gotten to that level yet. Additionally, if someone is employed through an organization and they have um, an an arm that involves work of community health workers, you can be introduced in uh, through that vein as well. Uh, there's different avenues, uh, different opportunities based on what organizations have funding for, because a lot of community health worker positions are uh, really grant funded and uh, or have to come in under a different umbrella to be employed in that in that role. But there's different avenues for it to happen. Yeah, and I, I just want to add that the contact tracing experience has been, it's unique because you've been hot, like contact tracers have been hired and they've been given the opportunity to really shine and show what they can do. Um, and so I know that this experience is going to lead to a bunch of different opportunities in community health work for the contact tracing core. Because really when you can uh, show the passion for helping your community, if it shines through enough, I feel that employers will, they'll snatch you up. Perfect. Thank you, Priscilla and Kim, for the clarifying details. And thank you for your amazing work and presentation. Um, for everyone else, please stick around in this room, specifically in the Douglas Park room, for our closing session toward a shared vision for health equity in Chicago, where we'll be talking about what is next for SUHI moving forward? What's next for the next 20 years? right? And we'll do that through a panel of stakeholders um, led by, um, with closing statements with by Helen. Um, so with that, stick around and we'll begin at 2.10. Thank you. And I'm just going to say this last thing for me and for our presentation is that um, for my colleagues at SUHI, I think you guys are amazing. Um, I think um, a lot of the passion that we all have is because of the experiences that we've had uh, with one another and in the work that we do for the training team uh, and shy strategy. You guys are doubly amazing because I get to work with you most often and to see your tenacity and strength rise through uh, is is just so rewarding and how we are able to translate uh, the community health worker arena to those who are not familiar um, is epic so thank you for being a great bunch of people to work with <laughs>